play. Okay, so welcome everyone from this. I'm Geeta Halley. I'm the assistant director here at the Round Rock Public Library. Today we have a speaker, Darren. Um, he's a lawyer and we've used him Darren, I don't know if you remember this, but you've come at least four times to this library in the last six, seven years that we've been doing this workshop. And for this particular topic, I always ask Bill, or when Bill picks you know, who, who we want, I always pick you uh, for your expertise and also because you're very funny. It's such a dry topic and you're, you, know, you make it interesting. Darren has condensed a two hour workshop into an hour and a half, but I wouldn't be doing right as a librarian if I, instead of doing talking maybe for three or four minutes about the library and our resources, I just, I don't want to take time away from Darren. So I'm just going to quickly show you um, on, on our website, please type in your Round Rock Public Library, only look for the research tab. And you can go to research by category, just like I'm doing. These are all the various databases in our, in our library jargon, it's called databases, but you can call it online resources, online tools in various subject matters. And, you know, and I'm scrolling through these. The one that I always talk about here at you know, for five, six minutes, but today I'm just going to run through this really quickly is the business section, because that's the section you really want to know very well. These are our resources that we have. This one in particular is, is very important to know because you can do um, market research, market segmentation uh, for your business. This one's a great one because um, it's, it, it will talk about, it will lead you through your financials to start a business. And, it, and if you're going to be a viable business, it is so good that it'll, be, it'll talk you out of starting a business if you don't have the correct financials. So it's a really good resource here. The, uh, the other one I wanna talk to you about is lynda.com. It's now LinkedIn Learning. This on your own would cost you $19.99. It's the same database that Google and Microsoft uses to train their employees. And you have this here for free with your library card. Um, the last one I wanna talk about is Reference Solutions. It used to be called Reference USA. It's a very, very powerful uh, business research tools uh, tool and it has charts and heat maps all kinds of things in it that um, that you can use to again to do more in depth research and to data mine about your competitors about the market about who lives in a particular zip code etc. So with that Darren will you please take over and I'll answer questions in the chat, if you have any, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction there. And two quick things I, I'll start with. I'm going to start screen, sharing my screen so y'all don't have to stare at me. Uh, of course, that's the real background behind me. I'm right now at the ocean hanging out here. And uh, so uh, yeah, first off, when it comes to SCORE, I highly, highly recommend their, uh, their mentoring sessions. When, when I was a young attorney, and I was once young, young back then, I used to actually use them uh, for my own uh, my own uh, learning and such to, to help out there. And they really kind of helped guide me and helped me kind of figure out exactly what I needed to do and really gave me another perspective to, to work with. Uh, and the library is wonderful too. Uh, you know, currently, I, I currently live out of state, unfortunately. I travel back and forth between Texas quite a bit here just so I can, you know, my clients are in Texas. I, I live in Florida and I work in Texas. So I've been telecommuting for about almost five years now. And uh, I still spend hours upon hours at our local library here and, and wish it was as good as the, the Round Rock Library. They try their best, but uh, you know, you just can't help, they just can't keep up with the people that really are holding, putting Round Rock Library together. So you guys are very lucky 
to have such a resource here and all that they present here. Uh, here's my little warning here. You know, you, I'm not your attorney. I, uh, I am simply uh, telling you what I know, setting a few things wrong that needs to be set wrong here. If you've got questions, put them in the chat. I don't do too much Zoom uh, presentations. In fact, this is my first one. I've been putting it off for a while. I am actually one of the few people that did a live presentation during uh, the pandemic, if you can believe that. I was able to convince SCORE and uh, Cedar Park to let me do that, and uh, they won't let me do that for a while here. So hopefully things will calm down and you know, we can do this in person here. So this is about me. Uh, yeah, I, as you can tell, I've got way too many degrees. I'm way too overeducated, and I've worked with a lot of businesses. All of these are businesses I've either worked for directly, been an owner, board member, what have you. And it's not trying to impress, it's there to show you that I've been in the trenches just like y'all uh, y'all have. And uh, it's a uh, working with them is very helpful with understanding them better and such. And hopefully I can give you some good advice uh, throughout this process that'll help guide you all as you decide what you need to do here. Uh, so what are we gonna talk about here? We're gonna talk briefly about entities. Well, not briefly, we're gonna talk about entities because really that's the core when you're starting a business is the entity that you select. We're gonna then move on to talking about DBAs, your employees and contractors, a couple basics on contracts and such, and a couple other important things that I think is kind of helpful that people have questions about and really don't get a good feeling with it. Uh, I will try to keep my eyes on the chat. I got a screen here in front of me I'm going to, I'm trying to keep the chat up so I can, you know, keep an eye there. If I see an answer, a question there, I, I will definitely try to pop in and answer it. So if I start talking incoherently or just you know, something's not quite making sense, happy, happy to try to answer it. Uh, but I always warn people that sometimes we get a little too deep in the rabbit hole. People start asking me very specific questions about their business. You're not getting really legal advice here. And, and so, you know, sometimes I go, yeah, that's something to talk to me later here. And, you know, I have no trouble punting and saying, hey, give me a call. We can chat about that later. My contact information is in the slides. You'll see it here a little bit later here. So let's talk about entities. There are really only four reasons that we form these companies. We uh, first one is we, we don't want to be liable for the company's debts. We don't want to pay those. The company is the one who invokes the is the one who's going to incur the expenses or have the loss and such. We personally don't want to pay for it, and we need to see how that looks at. You know, financing. You know, a lot of us can't start a business with just the money we have. We got to go get financing, either investments or we're going to get uh, uh, a loan. Uh, control. Uh, who runs it? Uh, because simple fact, you start bringing more than one owner, things have to be divvied up and you know everybody's not the same there. So we need how to run it. And of course, taxes, sometimes the tail is gonna wag the dog on your business and that will do stuff just for the tax reasons to, uh, and it decides you know what the entity is, what have you, and we'll kind of dive into that. So one thing I always preface there, because this confuses people quite a bit here, We've got two sovereigns. We got two kings above us. We have the United States, of course, which is our country. And then, of course, we also have the best darn country here in the United States, and that's Texas. Both of them are considered our sovereign, and they treat stuff differently, even if they are the same. So if you form a partnership in Texas, it may be taxed as a corporation, depending on what you want to do, as long as you follow the rules and such. Uh, and that can get confusing. For example, I have people, you know, start running debates on what is better, a partner forming as a part LLC or as a S corporation. Well, the joke is an LLC can be an S corporation because the LLC just refers to what was formed at the state level. The S corporation indicates that it was taxed. It's going to be taxed under subchapter S of the IRS code. Very boring. Subchapter C is a C corp, and so these. This gets confusing sometimes, but if you divide the two and say, look, when I'm talking about liability, what we're forming, how everything's run, we're talking about the state. If we're talking about taxes, we're talking about the feds because that's what matters on those things. So try to keep those straight and you, life will be a lot easier on this stuff. So the, 
Well, we're going to talk about the types of entities. Now we got lots and lots of more entities. We got national associations, all sorts of associations, professional companies, all these things are out there. We're not going to worry about that. We're just going to hit the basic types so we can get a good feeling. If you're going to form a professional company, we're going to need to make sure it's in the right profession and I'm not going to bore everyone uh, with that information. So we'll hit the main ones here. So if you're talking about a sole proprietorship, it is the most common entity you will ever see because it's just one guy who went out there and said, hey, I'm doing business. You said when you were a kid and you set up a lemonade stand and sold lemonade to your neighbors or Kool-Aid in my case, you were a sole proprietorship. Uh, basically, it's one person running a business for themselves. That's it. You can have a DBA or not DBA. It doesn't matter your sole proprietorship. Cheap and easy, you don't have to do anything. You're gonna form it there. The trouble is you're liable for everything you do, of course. The next one is one of the most important ones I talk about, it's general partnerships. Now, if you take one thing out of this entire lecture, it will be don't form a par general partnership. Now, yeah, you, I, you showed, I showed a bunch of businesses I've worked with over the years. One of the sad things I got to say is I have worked, you know, uh, you know, collecting debts. I have been the bad guy many, many times and bad guys have to do bad things to get paid. And, you know, from my client's side of the things, I wasn't the bad guy. I was the hero getting them paid for work they performed or things that they've sold and then people trying to stiff them. And so, you know, it's always from a point of perspective, but when I'm acting as the bad guy going after your business, most of the time I'm trying to turn you into a general partnership because the joy about a general partnership is everybody is liable for everything under a general partnership, every single owner. And so if I can turn you into a general partnership, uh, my client's gonna get paid. One of the funniest stories I ever ran into, I had this one startup that owed my client about $37,000. And I was talking to their attorney. He's like, they're poor, they're behind on my bills, they're behind on everything. And I'm like, look, we gotta get paid. My guy did this work and such, he's gotta get paid. Well, there's no way you can get the money. Bloody from, blood from a stone, he said. And I looked at his corporate documents and found out that, yeah, there's a little tax provision that I could get it treated like a general partnership. And so I looked through the board and found out that uh, one of the board members was a billionaire very famous. If I named the name, you'd go, oh yeah, that guy, uh, you know, lots and lots of money. And I realized he was personally liable. So he got a nice little letter saying I was getting ready to add him to this lawsuit. Uh, and we were going to come after them for money. I got a huffy call from his attorney telling me that how he's going to break me and my client and little things. And I said, you know, this company didn't file its taxes. And so therefore you're liable. And the guy's like, what? And I go, yeah. Yeah, it happened like four years ago. In fact, you're still liable for everything that company does as a director. What? Let me go check on that. Uh, the check was on my desk two days later. So, you know, general partnerships get you paid. So please don't make my job easy when I'm the bad guy, at least to give me a challenge. And, you know, don't do a general partnership on the offset because that's just too easy to, to, to do that there. If you don't listen to me, you can file for a limited liability partnership. I always call that protection money to the state. Basically for every partner, you pay them 200 bucks a year and they will give you some protection. It's kind of like the mafia, except it's Texas style. Uh, in that case, uh, we're not big fans of it. Used to be some advantages to it, but with current changes to code, I see them. When I see them form, they're usually formed by people that really didn't know what they're doing. So just avoid that. That's a good one to stay away from, if at all possible here. Uh, limited partnerships, I love. They, and don't confuse them with LLPs. An LP is a little bit different, has two different types of partners, general partners that run everything and are liable for anything that happens there though we usually form another company to be the general partnership partner to stop that liability. But then you have limited partners and they get full liability protection. They're not gonna get sued. They're not gonna be liable for the debts of the company as long as they stay within their lane. And we use that quite a bit because there's some really good tax benefits, estate planning and things like that. We use those quite a bit, especially when you're talking about investments into like real estate or other type of things that are very passive and you need one guy running things and the other partners just want to get a check every month. Uh, we're all familiar with corporations, multiple owners, 
It's run by the board, all sorts of things that we do. Uh, they're not popular among small business owners, but we still use them occasionally because there are some things that we can do with a uh, limited, with a corporation that are in the tax code that allows us to do a, quite a few different things. You know, stock options, for example, those are hard to do with an LLC. We're kind of faking it, trying to make, an, uh, make it like a corporation where we just do a corporation, we can do stock options and things like that. And there's a couple other things that we sometimes lean that way that corporations make sense. But most of the time we're doing the good old fashioned LLC. Uh, that's one of the newer entities that I ever created. Uh, yeah, very popular. Texas is actually one of the forefronts. I think we were the third state in the union to come up with an LLC. It, it basically combines the things we like about partnerships with the things that we like about corporations. And we put different terms for everything to confuse the heck out of everyone. And that's what we use for a default entity now. If, you come, if we talk and we're getting ready to do a formation for you, nine times out of 10, it's going to be an LLC because they're quick, simple, and cheap. And that combination is hard to beat here. And, you know, sometimes we set up LLCs initially and we need to change it to something later. And like my grandmother would say, you know, you should be so lucky you have such problems. And so we usually start with this and go other go forward here. And this is the time in the I usually start asking everybody, hey, do you got a question here? But I don't see any on there. So we'll keep going. But if you ask a question, we will slide in, and try to answer it there. Uh, personal liability. Like I said, when we do these entities, it's all one of the main things we're trying to do is limiting personal liability so the owners don't get sued. Uh, you know, when you're the, when I'm going to collect and I'm the bad guy trying to get money out of people, I'm going to sue everybody. I'm going to try to sue everyone that's possible, whether I think they're going to be liable or not, because the more people I sue, the more people are there to pay. And most people pay to get her done there. And a lot of times there's indemnification. You sue an employee, you're doing it for certain reasons. But most of the time, the, the business's insurance is going to cover it. Because let's face it, I do believe you can't get blood from a stone. So, you know, you're looking for certain pockets, but there's reasons to sue otherwise there. So let's look at each entity and just kind of talk about, you know, what type of liability we're talking about here on these companies and such. So the first thing we look at is if you set up the company, you're always going to be liable. No matter what, we don't have to do anything else. And that is, you know, a sole proprietorship, you just started doing business, a general partnership, everybody's liable for everything, very bad, or the general partner and a limited partner. In those cases, we don't even have to go any further in analysis. We know they're liable 100% there. Now, generally, also, we know some people aren't liable. For example, limited partners or the LLC owner, the members there, or a corporation's going to protect the shareholders, or an LLP, you paid your protection money there. Uh, so the state's going to say, no, 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 there's liability protection on your partnership. Now, each one of them has a little bit different protections. For example, limited partnerships, almost bulletproof. If you don't act as a general partner, you will not have liability under state law. In fact, in some states, uh, even if you screw up and start acting like a general partner, you'd be protected. But Texas says if you act like a general partner, you will be treated as a general partner. But it still gives you the best protection as a limited partner if possible. LLCs and corporations, they get a kind of, they're kind of treated very similar under state law. In fact, a lot of times when we uh, start looking at LLCs, since they are newer and corporations are very old, we will apply corporate standards to an LLC. And you know, sometimes the courts let us do that. Other times the courts put their foot down and we have to wait for the legislature. There was a little provision in, uh, in the, the code that would allow attorney fees to be recovered on a breach of contract uh, if you sued a corporation, individual or partnership, but it was, that statute was passed before LLCs. And so the court for some reason said, hey, LLCs aren't included. And so for years, if you sued an LLC on a contract, you wouldn't be able to recover attorney fees necessarily, unless you had another way to go at it. Well, the legislature just changed that. And so LLCs are gonna be treated the same as corporations starting actually last month. So, you know, generally this is how these things work. But if you do have liability protection, we're going to, of course, me being the bad guy I am, I'm gonna to try to pierce it and get through it. Now. The ones I'm listing right now, you're seeing right this second, those are ones that are very uncommon. 
one of these by themselves may not be enough to completely uh, pierce the corporate veil, or we just don't see it very often. Uh, for example, failure to fully form an entity. I had a client come to me last week that said, hey, I formed a company, but I need you to draft a company agreement for my LLC. And according to the statute, he didn't form a company. Uh, an LLC is actually a creature of contract. That's what every, every court case will tell you. It's a creature of contract. If you haven't done your contract, it really doesn't exist. And so if you don't fully form the company, it's gonna be treated as a general partnership. Now, judges are very forgiving on this one here. And I've never seen the fact that there wasn't a company agreement to be enough to say, hey, everyone is going to be liable here. But I've seen cases where everyone's held liable and that's mentioned specifically in the list of reasons why they made the decision. So commingling assets. This one we see quite a bit when we're doing collections. And the, what, what ends up happening is people start spending their private money for the company or start spending company money, which is much more often on their private stuff. And it goes back and forth. Oops, I went wrong direction. Can I back up? There we go. Uh, and they, you know, the, the money goes back and forth and back and forth. And so I'm trying to get money out of the company. And it's so confusing at a certain point, I look at the judge and go, your honor, I cannot figure out what money is the company, what money is the individual. Let's sue them both. So you, neither one of us have to figure that out. And the court will usually, uh, if it's bad enough, will say, yeah, let's do it that way because well, I don't want to go through the accounting to you. And so, you know, you see that mingling between assets, between your checking accounts and such. And of course, you got to pay yourself and, and things like that. Everything's documented. That's going to be fine. But it's when you start paying that, you know, uh, that uh, cable bill with the business, uh, with the business assets for your, you know, your HBO subscription or, you know, you start going through and buying groceries using the company credit card. Uh, you know, you can correct that with the accounting, but a lot of times people don't. And it just becomes a mess and everything, it's just easier to sue everyone. Uh, improper distribution of funds happens when, let's say, you know, uh, this business I'm going after and I'm trying to get paid, they've got $100,000 in the bank and they go, huh, why don't I just declare a dividend and get myself paid for that? And there's not $100,000 in the company and they can sue it and do what they want to that company and I've got the money and Mr. Creditor, it can't get the money from us there. And, uh, you know, or, you know, I'm going to hire my cousin to go, uh, you know, mow my lawn for $100,000. So I'll pay him $100,000. It's a contract, not a good contract necessarily, but uh, it's a contract. I pay the cousin and there's no money for Darren to get money for his client there. Well, we're going to see through that charade, that charade. And, you know, they, we're gonna, the judge is going to look at that, get very grumpy and let me sue everybody. And that just suits me pretty well. That's actually a happy thing for me to see. Uh, the other one in, you know, preferential transfer in anticipation of bankruptcy, basically the bankruptcy trustee can undo any transaction, whether it was done legitimately or not. It could be the most, you know, you paid the internet bill for the company. The bankruptcy court trustee can say, no, 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 we're going to reverse that, give the money back. I want to give it to someone else that is owed money by this creditor. And it works. And so, you know, it, it, it's up to, I believe, 60 days going back. You'll have to, not a bankruptcy guy, so I try to stick out of it. I just know when I see it, there's a problem there and, you know, you got to flag it and deal with it. But the most common, these are the ones that will get you. And I've gotten others many times on these is the, the ones I'm showing here. Number one is agency law. Now, those of you may not, uh, who aren't uh, lawyer geeks like I am uh, may not realize that corporations and LLCs are people too. Uh, they have all sorts of constitutional rights that, you know, maybe, you know, we didn't quite understand. Uh, a corporation has the right to speak. They have the, uh, we, we know that, you know, they have the right to don donate money. Uh, they also have the right to religion. So, you know, uh, Hobby Lobby taught us that there. In fact, my office uh, we, uh, we're, we're jokesters. That's our religion there. And we have the best health care possible because we believe that, uh, you know, laughter is the best medicine. So if you get sick, we give you a joke book and, you know, it, it takes care of problems there. 
But uh, what I've noticed about corporations is they don't seem to be able to pick up checks. They don't seem to pay things. They can't really act on their own. Uh, if you ever see a corporation jogging or you know driving a car, please let me know and I'm gonna change what I'm talking about here. But normally it has to act through agents. And when you work through an agent, there's certain rules that are already set up that says, hey, agency, this is the rules on these things. And one of the things that happens is people will forget to indicate that they're an agent and then and they'll sign a document there. Well, if you do that, you're technically considered a secret agent and not the good one that gets double O in front of your number and gets to shoot people for fun. Uh, in fact, you know, you're a secret agent. What happens under Texas law for a secret agent is you're liable for everything that you signed as if you weren't an agent. Now the company's liable and you. And that just makes collection for me real easy. If the guy who signed the document, I can go get the money from. And so make sure when you sign company documents correctly, you sign them the right way. And of course I immediately bumped my computer there. So to do it right there, you indicate who it's for. In this case, it's XYZ Corp Incorporated. And then you indicate that you're doing it by, you'd sign it yourself and then indicate who you are and why you have the right to sign. Now, if you forget one, let's say, you know, John Doe here forgot president, it's probably gonna still be good. I mean, you can tell XYZ Corporation by John Doe. Yeah, that's probably gonna be good. But if you forgot XYZ Corp and it says by John Doe president, I don't know. Or it just says by John Doe, probably not gonna work here. But John's probably liable in that situation. So there's a bunch of different things that could that can go pierce that corporate veil. So watch on that one. Agency is an easy one. I have that is a very successful way to go after if you're if the guy is trying to collect the money and it notices that documents weren't sent correct. The next one. Failure to file your public information report. Now, in Texas, we have some very low taxes. Your company generates less than a million dollars a year. You don't owe anything, not a thing, but you still have an obligation to, uh, let me move my phone out of the way. You still have an obligation to pay your taxes, to file your taxes, even if you don't owe them, and to indicate who owns the, uh, who controls the company. And this tax code specifically talks about that. And so sometimes people forget to file taxes. Now the comptroller sends out a notice and says, hey, you forgot to do this. And most people never see that letter. It either goes to the round bin, goes to the wrong address, what have you, and they forget to do it. Now you file taxes next year, the comptroller doesn't say a word about it. They go, thank you for filing your taxes and that's it there. Well, the tax code says, once you've missed a tax one, you're gonna get suspended. And when you're suspended, you're treated, like I was telling you earlier, as a general partnership and everybody's liable there. And so the first thing I do when I try to do a collection of any size is I check and see, make sure their taxes are filed because we come across this quite a bit. There's been some changes to law that makes this happen a little less frequently, but it still happens and it makes collections easy. Uh, Final one we always talk about is, I usually talk about is your personal bad acts. If you do something bad, you're liable, even if you're doing it as a company. And people will say many times, look, I'm not a bad person. I don't do bad acts. And I always respond with, well, have you ever been in a car accident? That's your fault. That's a bad act. Simple negligence, bad act. Now, most of the time you're covered by insurance, you're covered by everything. And you know, if you're driving a truck for Walmart, and get in an accident, yeah, that truck driver is liable, but nobody wants the truck driver's money. They want Walmart's money. Well, in small businesses, usually the business doesn't have that much money. It's all gone to the owner. And so we're trying to go the other way and go after that truck driver in that situation because he's the owner and actually has the money. In that case, you're gonna be liable. It applies to everything. The final one's kind of new one that's, this is one of the new, sexy things in my area of law, which you can tell is pretty sad in a way, that that's what we call a sexy. Uh, it's calling yourself owner. We're seeing this quite a bit. When you identify yourself as an owner, people are claiming that they don't think they're dealing with an LLC or a corporation or something like that, that they thought they were dealing with a sole proprietorship. And because of that, they should be able to be held loyal. loyal uh, the, the, sole, the owner should be held liable. Well, that's sticking. So watch yourself, don't call yourself the owner. You're the president, you're the manager, you're whatever it is, you're not the owner. 
because you're just asking for them to come after you if you do that. I see we have a question. Uh, we have a couple different questions. Uh, I'll answer the actual legal ones. The other ones can be answered out there. Uh, about forming an LLC for personal protection. How can I move ownership of the property from myself to LLC? Uh, how do we change ownership from property that we own to an LLC? It depends on the property. For example, if it's a car, you would have to move the title over. If it's you know personal property, such as a desk or something like that, you know a simple bill of sale that you download off the internet is going to be good enough. Put a little list on what you're transferring over, boom, your company agreement, if you're really careful, uh, mentions that as your initial contribution, and it's, it's good to go. Uh, it, just a simple document's all you need to, do, need to do to be able to move stuff over there. And it's very important, especially for tax purposes and such, when determining what the company is worth uh, for taxes and such, to do that correctly and account for it correctly. If not, you may have a few other issues. All right, next question. Do you have to sign everything this way? Well, there's exceptions for uh, uh, like checks. So you know, the question is, do we have to sign everything XY Corp, XYZ Corp Incorporated by John Doe president? Uh, checks, there's an exception for it. You don't have to do that. But if you sign a contract, yeah, that's the way you should sign, sign a contract every single time. If it's an issue, go buy a stamp. They'll, you know, when I do more complicated entities like limited partnerships in which the limited partners acting through a general partner being, being operated by a president, I actually buy a stamp for my client so they can stamp the document and then put their initials or sign their name in the space provided to protect it there. But really think about it. How many times do we normally sign our name for document for things? Where we see this really a problem there is service people. A service guy comes in to fix your H HVAC and asks you to sign the thing. You need to be careful there, especially if you're not paying cash right then and there. If it's on bill, you could be sued or something like that. You got to make sure it's clearly indicating they're doing business with the business. If not, they're going to claim they did business with you and they're going to come after you no matter what. So the entire thing is being absolutely clear that you're acting as an agent and not as the principal. And there's a different ways that you can protect yourself that way. Uh, the recording, I'll leave it. Yes, I believe the recording will be available later. Uh, I, I'll, I'll leave that to Bill to get that, talk about that a little bit later. Next question, how do you set your business up under a trust? And does, does that have to happen at the start? Does this strategy uh, overcomplicate things? Uh, it depends on the situation, really. Yeah, you, you really should do a develop at the start. I mean, technically, you can move the business into a trust later. Uh, trust or you usually have their own purposes, and it's really hard to get a really answer that question when I don't know the purpose of the trust, or you know, because the the company we set up to form you know liability protection, the four things we talk about here, but you know, trust at a different level. Uh, that's a little bit different because we use trust a lot of time with real estate, but we won't have an entity underneath it there or, you know, is different things like that. For those who don't know, a trust is when you hold property for another for another in your name. Uh, so, you know, you own legal title, but the beneficial titles on someone else. If I have a trust for my children, that means I hold the property and I have a little, you know, 529 trust. So hopefully they'll go to college someday. Uh, I own the property right now, but it's held in trust for them because there's tax uh, there's tax advantages to that. And so they're the beneficial owners on that. So I hold it for their benefit. Uh, the Britney Spears conservatorship would kind of give you an example there. Jamie Spears whole, held her property in trust and now there's allocations that seemed pretty solid that uh, Mr. Spears was holding that property to benefit himself and not Brittany. And that's why Christina Aguilera is like three to four times as wealthy as Brittany is despite, despite Brittany having twice as many number one records. So kind of put in that way there. All right, next question. That property as house and land situation when your mortgage yeah, yeah um, Myla, I, I'm not sure where that previous question's coming from <laughs> because, you know, it, it, it's running there. 
uh, with, with trust and things like that. Again, that's more complicated than this. This is business. I'm starting a business. You're starting to do trust and, and such. You're doing estate planning in addition to other things. And it's well beyond what we can handle here in an hour and a half. Uh, next question, if you're a sole proprietorship, is just filing the federal taxes with a Schedule C that includes the business sufficient, or is there something else that needs to be filed with the state? Uh, first off, when you file federal taxes, you're not filing with the state. Uh, second of all, there could be several things you could be filing with the state, but may or may not apply in this situation. For example, you may need to file a BBA. We'll talk about that later. You may have sales tax that needs to be collected and reported. There, there's a lot of things that could be done with the state. Technically, if you're out there in an exempt thing, uh, doing exempt work that doesn't have to be filed with state and you're just doing it and you don't need a license or anything like that, there wouldn't be anything you had to do to the state if you're working on your own personal name. But of course, you got unlimited liability, all sorts of bad things. Banks will probably shun you and look the other way when you walk in the room. So watch yourself on things like that. Bill's responding, let's see, again, it's, again, if you get 1099 from a client and you have an S Corp, do you have to do sales tax for services? No goods were sold. You, again, that's a tax question. I'm an attorney. Talk to, uh, ask an accountant if you have a tax question there. I know enough to be dangerous. Generally, services aren't taxed. That's all I know, but there's lots and lots of exceptions. Uh, final question, then I will move on to something. How can I move ownership of my house or land into an LLC? It's a deed. We use deed to transfer ownership of property. Is a situation when there's a mortgage and when the property is paid off. Yeah, traditionally, you can't move property into, uh, into an LLC if there's a mortgage on it. Basically, you are committing a default right there and it's subject to immediate foreclosure. And it's actually not curable. So the bank, if they want to, can take the property at that point, sell it for pennies on the dollar and you can get rid of it that way. So we usually don't recommend doing that. And I set up, I do a lot of those transfers there. A lot of times we're using series LLCs too. That's kind of the new Vogue way we're doing that. But again, that's a specialty one. We're not going to go there. So I'm going to leave questions for now. We're going to go hit into the next section if I can convince it to go. There we go. So financing. That's one of the reasons we form these entities is because we have financing and want to get money to run the business. And really, there's only two ways you can ever finance a business if you ain't coming up with the money yourself. First off, you can borrow the money or two, you can sell ownership in the business. Really, there's not much other ways to do that. Each one's a little bit different. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with debt, of course, there's, uh, there's uh, the people like to get repaid. You got your monthly payments and stuff like that. You also might have to secure some of the property so they can come seize it if you don't pay it. Lots of different things go, go there. On equity, of course, there's all sorts of other issues there because when you get another owner in there, they seem to think if they give you money, they can tell you what to do. I know it should be wrong, but they actually believe that. And so, you know, you gotta, you're gonna get certain problems with that. Additionally, anytime you raise money, you gotta comply with securities laws. And securities laws are very, very tricky I deal with very, very basic security questions. Once you get into the upper level ones, I refer them to someone that that's all they do. It's kind of like you guys who specialize in tax. They only touch that. In fact, the guys who specialize in tax usually are experts in just a small, small area that they know very, very well. The rest of it, they just kind of, they, they might have a general idea there. But you know, on securities, I'll give you an example. Let's say you are in Vegas meeting with a guy from New York who's investing with a California company, which law applies? And the answer is every law you could think of. You got federal law that's gonna apply. You got Texas law applying. You got Nevada law applying. You got New York law and California all in that instance. And to be honest, if you were selling them and you haven't registered with New York, you've already violated uh, New York law, if you're not, re if you don't get an exemption through the feds and you had to do a filing to do that. So you're already dirty at that point there. So the most important thing to keep in mind, if you start selling securities, make sure you talk to someone that knows the securities. And, you know, we get people that try to pitch everything there. I always suggest holding that ownership tight and don't start giving it away unless you absolutely have to. It's just way too precious. 
because you don't get it back, okay? All right, I'm gonna double check questions real quick because I saw Bill responded there. We're, uh, we're looking good there. So here's a little, a little layout to tell you who's in control of the different entities. Kind of uh, easy, sole proprietorship, it's the owner, children partnership. All the owners are in charge of everything. Limited partners, you only get the general partner in charge, corporations, you got yeah, the officers actually run everything after they're appointed by the directors and uh, they were elected by the shareholders. LLCs, we can do it any way you want to. It's very, very flexible and it's really what we want to decide. One of the important things to realize though in partnerships and LLCs, we can actually say people are only charged to a certain level. So we can say, you know, Bill here is in charge of marketing and Gita here is in charge of operations and Bill can't sign a contract with suppliers. Gita can't sign them with a marketing company. And that's perfectly enforceable between the different people. But to third parties who don't know about it, they're not responsible for it. So if Bill goes and signs, you know, a, a, a sales contract or operation, somebody wasn't supposed to sign, he's still, the company's still liable. Now the company may have a claim against Bill, but the company's on the hook 100%. And so you gotta be careful on how you structure these things and such. And you gotta trust who you're in business with. If, you, if you're in business with someone that's gonna have authority in the company, you better be able to trust them to do what's, what, what you need done. There's ways to prevent that, for example, uh, if you got an LLC and it's managed by managers, you just don't make them a manager. Just because someone owns half the company doesn't mean they manage it and operate that. You can have a minority partner or a large partner. Some of the scary ones I've seen is we'll get a company that's an LLC who as, you know, as good people they are, it's member managed and the owner goes, hey, I'm gonna give this key employment employee 1% ownership. Well, with that 1% ownership in a member managed company, as a member, that person can go get a bank loan if they want to. They and it's not the bank loans that usually gets them. They go, you know, a supplier will come in and they'll be like, "Hey, I need to talk to the owner." Well, the owner's not here, or I'm an owner. You can talk to me, and that's when he starts selling widgets left and right. And you're like, "Hey, we only sell ten widgets a year. Why did you buy a hundred thousand of them?" And you go to the supplier and go, "He couldn't do that." Yes, he could. And that, that's enough to sink some companies there. So watch who you give authority to. That's very, very important here. Uh, can single member LLC be called owners? Yes, but you're gonna be held personally liable. So you're kind of wasting your time setting up as an LLC in that case. Uh, the important thing is, you know, just don't call yourself an owner. I'd call myself manager in that case because I do it as a manager managed. And if I'm setting up a single person LLC, I still do it manager managed. And I have, uh, would have my client in that case, the owner, uh, identify themselves as manager every single time. Okay. All right. We're going to keep going. What fun thing? We're talking about termination issues. There's only three ways out of your business once you form it. You're going to die. You're going to sell it. Or you're going to wrap it up. You're going to wind it up. That's it. Now, it's real important on the front end, especially if, it, you know, if it's just you starting that business and such, you don't have to worry about it too much there. You probably want to make sure you know what happens to it when you die, have some succession planning in place. But the other ones don't worry you too much there. When you have multiple owners, though, these other ones become absolutely key. Because the simple fact there, when you start a business, you got this thing that after a while you won't have. That's called hope. And, you know, business is hard. You mean, you own, when you are running and owning a business, it's a hard thing to do. And there are some dark days. I'm not going to lie to you. I remember when I started up my practice there, there were days I would stare at that phone because I played too much solitaire and it wouldn't ring no matter what I did. And it depresses you and it's tough. And, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I'm sure you want to start a business after hearing that, but, you know, it's the truth. I mean, anything that's worth doing is usually not easy. So, you know, at that point, you know, they, when you're in the dark throes of doing there, it's a tough thing to do. Now, imagine if there's two or three of you going through that at the same time, and perhaps there are a personality defect or two that kind of rub you the wrong way. Uh, you know, maybe they use the term 
accept wrongly or something like that. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You guys are going to be a little bit on each other's nerves. And let's say the business goes, starts going south and, you know, one person wants to leave and you guys are not getting along or anything like that. It's real tough to reach an agreement at that point when everybody hates each other. You know, the guy who's leaving, he's like, look, we had these plans. This is a multi-million dollar business. I, I know we've only added a year, but in five years, this business is going to be worth $10 million. And so I'm a reasonable man. I'm a one third owner. I don't need $3 million. I'll take a half a million today for the privilege of giving up my ownership and you two can make the big money. You're welcome. Now, the other ones are like, what are you talking about? We're right now $200,000 in debt and we brought in $500 last month. We don't, you know, we, we, we still believe we're going to be worth 10 million after all that time, but you know, we, we're not there yet. And this company is not even close to worth a half a million in total. Now, as everybody's fighting and such, and we can't get this thing resolved, business will probably go under because we haven't planned for it. Now, if it's planned correctly, we have something in the company agreement, assuming it's an LLC or a shareholder agreement, whatever it is, that says, hey, owners number one or two, you can buy them out. Or you can force him to think about buying you out and say, no, 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 buy, we're going to sell out one way. But we can deal with these issues. And the time to make that agreement is early in the process while we all like each other and we have lots and lots of hope. And we can work out all, pro it's a lot easier to work with these problems when it's merely theoretical. You know, the business failing, the one of us wanting to leave, that's impossible. That's what it said day one in my office. Day 400, when it's been difficult and such, there might be a different story. So plan out for these things up front. They can vary quite a bit there. And there's all sorts of things that we can do to do for sales and things like that. For example, you know, here's a few questions, but the example I always like to talk about is let's say Bill and I and Gita, we start up a restaurant and we do know, you know, restaurants, how they make money. It's not through selling food. It's through uh, selling booze. The alcohol is what's going to make us money here. And so we're going to say we're selling restaurant, we're selling tacos well, but we're selling lots and lots of margaritas and they're good margaritas and they, they're the best around. And in fact, they are so good. I'm sitting at the bar one evening talking with Bill and we're having a good time. And I throw down a few margaritas and I have a couple more. And Bill's like, well, I need to go home. I got to open at six. So he grabs a cab and goes. And I go, well, I'll jump into my car and drive. And wouldn't you know it, Austin Police Department's finest uh, discover me using all three lanes on Mopac to go home. Pulls me over, rested, bad things happen. Well, the issue here is, uh, you know, uh, ABC is not a big fan of convicted drunks uh, having a liquor license, and liquor license is in my name. So perhaps Gita and Bill's best move is to get rid of me because I become a liability and I may cause problems to, and lose their liquor lot they may lose their liquor license because of my drinking and issues there they need to force me out other things you know you know moral issues or something like that there's all sorts of different things we can deal with each one of those in whatever situation that's going along also when you sell a business you know let's say uh bill and i go hey we want to sell this business Gita doesn't want to can we make it force her to maybe Depends on what the agreement says. We sometimes force a uh, drag along, we call it drag along, or if Bill and I want to sell and Gita wants a part of the action, she can tag along. And so we can deal with all those situations up front. We'll all agree it's theoretical and there's not money involved here. So, all right. Next, my goodness, we got some good uh, long questions here. Uh, if you have a one-person LLC in Texas that is an online business, how do you protect yourself from potential worldwide client customer base? Can international, uh, there's a lot of different things to do. That's a loaded, long question there <laughs> with lots of answers. Let, let's talk the sec. That we'll, we'll keep going, though. There's more to the question. Can international clients sue you? Yes, they can absolutely sue you. Would you just get errors and omissions insurance with worldwide coverage to go with your LLC protection? It depends. It really does. 
different insurance covers different things that may deal with things. And Arizona Missions uh, will protect you if you're providing services, but if you're selling widgets that go defective, ENO isn't going to protect you. You're going to need, uh, you know, uh, a different type of insurance there. Insurance coupled with the liability protection provided by the company will definitely give you a, as about a complete protection as you can. Another thing that you would want to look at is, you know, terms and services. That's the contract between you and your customers that limit what's going on. For example, you can tell that Oregon person, if you want to do business and buy from my website, you have, and you want to sue me, you got to sue me here in Texas where the judges are saying, and will actually rule for my, on my hometown basis and do good things. Or you can say, we waive a jury trial. I don't wanna see what a crazy jury will do. Or an arbitration, we can force them into arbitration or something like that. And so the terms and conditions is the missing piece that you really need to protect there in this situation. And I think that answers your question there. Uh, Sylvia is asking, are there a general agreement that any company can use or it has to be specific to the surface? Again, you're gonna find out us attorneys love one answer and that's always, it depends. I mean, I've seen situations where an off the off the forum off the web uh, agreement would fit perfectly, and it works fine, and it's close enough, and that's fine. Uh, one example I'll give, like an IP assignment agreement. I mean, there's just basically one or two different ways to do it. The form isn't that important. That that'll cover it there. But in other situations, you really got to do your own custom agreement. If you're doing software development. Your master service agreement should definitely be something that works with how you develop software, how you deal with change orders, how you set up your, uh, you know, how your liability provisions, how much warranty you're willing to give, everything that your salespeople are promising needs to mirror there. And so something off the, the internet is not going to help you and probably hurt you. Some of the funniest ones I get is people go, oh, I just need you to review this agreement for me. I got it. It's perfect and such. And I go through there and it refers to the company in four or five different ways. I call that Frankenstein because it's obviously that someone has stitched together about four or five different agreements because the terminology changes and all that stuff throughout. And what ends up happening when you put together a body, especially when you don't do it for a living like I do, you're going to miss a piece. You're going to forget to put that heart in or lungs into your Frankenstein and he is not going to live. Same is true with the contract. You're going to forget that liability protection. You're going to forget, you know, venue selection or something like that. And it's going to cause you some issues there. So, you know, it's always risk reward. You know, there, I, I will tell people every day, there's nothing that I do that you couldn't do yourself with enough time and training. I mean, I wasn't just born a lawyer. I just, I learned a lot. I study a lot. I studied a lot in school. I study a lot now and try to keep up with things and such and see, I see a lot of things go wrong and we learn from those just as much. And so, you know, the same is true on this. So off the, off the uh, internet uh, forums, uh, a lot of times they cause more trouble than they're worth. So if it fits your situation, that's great. If not, you know, it, it's best to, to do it the right way instead of uh, do it the wrong way. As the joke goes, you know, I charge, you know, I charge a, a, a low rate to do it right the first time. You tried it once yourself, I charge double. You had somebody else do it and screw it up, I charge triple. Uh, you know, it, the rate goes up the more it got screwed up. So, next question, next thing I always talk about is where should I form my entity? And for most people, that answer is the greatest country in this nation, and that is Texas. We, as you can tell, even in Florida, I, I drink Topo Chico. In fact, I drink so much, they went from having singles at my local grocery store to cases. So, uh, yeah, I'm single-handedly moving Topo Chico from Texas to Florida just so I can keep myself hydrated here. But uh, back to Texas. It is probably the best for small business. And the reason is we've got very low reasonable taxes, even once you start having to pay taxes. Because of course, you gross less than a million dollars, you're not paying taxes, you just fill some forms. We don't have lots of hidden fees. I, I tell you that most states, there's all sorts of different hidden fees. I'm licensed in three states. I practice a little bit in the other two, but it's 99% of the times Texas. But when I deal with like stuff in Florida or Missouri, I'm just shocked at how 
little get me here, get you there, little charge here, you know, annual filing fees and stuff like that. Texas, it's free. I filed the public information report. I file my no tax due. I'm done. Didn't pay a dime. Just had to do it online. Works great. Well, well designed there. We also don't believe in regulations. Uh, we try to avoid that with a passion. In fact, you know, I see some of the regulations are coming out of the legislature and I'm like, that is the least Texas thing I ever saw. We like to protect our businesses by not having a lot of, of uh, uh, regulation. We're also not expensive all the way across there. But, you know, if Texas isn't making sense, number two on my list is Delaware. Delaware is considered the premium law in the United States when it comes to entities. And there's a reason for that. The main one, the first one is because they focus and try very hard to have the best. When some other state does any innovation, they go, hey, that's smart. They immediately adopt it and put it in there. Uh, the second thing is they're judges. So if you and I get into a dispute over an ownership uh, of a business here in Texas, we're going to probably file that suit in district court or county court. And they're their courts of general jurisdiction. And so that judge, before he hears our case, may have had to do a divorce, sentence a guy to 20 years into prison, or they could have done all sorts of different things. You know, a child custody case, uh, you know, there, there's, they deal with all sorts of legal issues. In Delaware, when it comes to ownership uh, disputes and things of that nature, you have dedicated courts, the courts of chancery. And so all they deal with is business disputes. That means you get very knowledgeable judges. So for example, in Texas, I've had cases where I've had to explain to the judge what a trademark is and why they are important, which from my perspective just blows my mind. Yeah. But in Delaware, I don't have that problem. In Delaware, which I don't practice there, I, I had to hire someone if there's a dispute like that, the judge knows what a trademark is. He probably knows it better than I am. And I practice in that area there because that's what he does. And so in that case, you get good decisions that really kind of work it out there. Uh, no juries for corporate matters. You're trying to jump right to the bench where in Texas, you have a right to jury to nearly anything if you haven't waived it all right. Uh, they have low taxes, but at the same time, you're going to be regulated by the state of Delaware and the state of Texas at the same time. And the scariest part, and this is the part where, you know, sometimes you do stuff and uh, you, you talk to the guy who knows what's going on and goes, oops, you screwed that up. Uh, the first thing you have to do when you form a Delaware company, if you're operating out of Texas, is register with the state of Texas. And so they're going to charge you about $1,000 to do that. And then you have to file taxes in Delaware and Texas at the same time. And so for a small business, over-regulating yourself is one of the worst things you can do. So watch yourself. Delaware is good, but you know, be careful there. Huh. Actually, so a question here from Sherry is why hasn't Texas matched Delaware? We actually do very, very well. I mean, Texas has some of the best regulations in the in the in the nation. Uh, third one to adopt uh, LLCs, even before Delaware did. We do the same thing. Delaware law is actually so strong. If I'm in a Texas courtroom uh, and I'm arguing something for the judge and there's no case on point in Texas, we use a Delaware one. Because De Texas, uh, several of the decisions have said, look, we basically mirror Delaware. We have our own tricks and such because we're better than they are but we adopt stuff just like Delaware does. For example, the series LLC was invented, I think about 10 years ago by Delaware. We almost immediately adopted it and we're using it a bunch. Now, there's some risk when you do something new because you never know what the judges will do. And so innovation can be a little dangerous in, in business because we like certainty, but Texas does keep up very well. All right, moving on here. Other states, Nevada. I use Nevada occasionally to form entities. We like holding companies there, especially for IP, where we're funneling lots and lots of money because of uh, tax purposes and such. The only trouble with Delaware, with uh, Nevada, is you know they try to be Texas, but they're Nevada, so uh, you know it's a uh, it, it's a 
the state isn't quite as honest as Texas and a little bit screwier. Anyone from Nevada there, I apologize if I besmirch your state, but every Nevada person I've ever talked to went, yeah, that describes us pretty good there. There's also lots of hidden fees. Uh, when, when I have to do my filing and in, in, uh, do filings in Nevada, there's a corporate list filing uh, tax, there's a filing tax. Oh, and they have one other really screwy law that says you actually have to have an office in Nevada. The office can be a cube. And when I say a cube, a one by one cube, but there's gotta be an office there with corporate books and such. And if they catch you uh, get, breaking the rules and they want to, they do bad things to you. So, you know, there's some good things about Nevada, but at the same time, you are playing with fire if you don't do it right. Other states, sometimes it makes sense. I mean, I've set up entities in other states because there's boots to the ground in that state. We want to do it that way instead of a registration. Uh, those situations are kind of particular and you got to be careful. Outside the United States, I always mention that because you go on the Craigslist, you will find, you know, form in, you know, the Bahamas or form in Bermuda and such. Look, that's some very tricky stuff to do correctly. And most of the time, they're just trying to convince you to do tax evasion and getting a little money out of you for it. So don't do that. You're the guy who's going to be the holding the bag or the gal who's going to be holding the bag. Do it right. Keep it simple up front. Don't put too much structure. When, don't, don't try to overstructure your startup because again, you become successful, start making too much money, we can restructure everything and, and get more tax advantages and use some of the tricks out there. Uh, and you got the money flowing in to do that. Right now, watch your pennies when, you, when you're when you doing these things and do it right uh, and keep it simple, stupid. So, all right, next, DBAs. What's a DBA for? It's basically anytime you do business on anything other than your four, full corporate name, you need a DBA. For example, if you drop the LLC or ink on your name, you're technically on your corporate name, you technically can need to file a DBA. A lot of banks will also require you to have a DBA, even if you don't need it. And so I've got an argument with countless banks to the point where I no longer argue with them. I just filed the DBA. And so I got some DBA examples here. Sharks are awesome incorporated. Sharks are awesome. It is the name. Sharks are awesome incorporated is the name of the corporation. We got sharks are awesome. Sharks, Bob's fish bait. The law office is a shark and minnow. Which one of these do you need to file a DBA for? And it would be for all of them because they aren't the full corporate name. And that includes yourself. If you're doing business, you know, if if Bill does a business called Bill's Squids in which he sells fresh squids to people, he needs a DBA for that because his last name is not Squid. Uh, you know, and it's, you know, it's all encompassing. The nice thing is Texas has simplified things. It used to be a complicated thing when you filed DBAs. You had to file one at the state level. You had to file one in the county of your principal place of business unless you're operating in so, and then you had to file in multiple different counties and blah, blah, blah. And Travis County filing a DBA was like trying to pull a tooth. In fact, I had more than one time where I was hired as a young lawyer in which just to walk a DBA through county, uh, through Travis County just to get her done. Uh, you know, things have simplified so much now and we just file with the state, doesn't have to be notarized. We just say, hey, this is our other name and that's all we need to do. And it gets taken care of there. So DBAs are simple, but you need to do it right. Uh, if you go from a sole proprietorship, for example, over to an LLC, you're going to need to file a DBA and disclaim your old one. If not, when you get sued, they're going to say, hey, I thought I was dealing with that sole proprietorship, not that LLC that I can't get through the liability protection. And so DBAs are important in these situations. Uh, Larissa is asking, do you need a DBA if, you're, if you are doing an LLC? Uh, I'm going to assume that is you are an LLC. Uh, it depends. Again, if you're just using your full LLC name, for example, in the case of my businesses, one of my business, the one we'd be talking about right now, it's the law of Darren Seedkeys, comma, PLLC. Uh, if that's the only name I ever use, then no, I wouldn't need it. But if I wanted to call myself the law of Darren Seedkeys, yes, I do. And so in most cases, people need a DBA, uh, no matter what type of entity they are, and they need to, uh, 
get it filed with the state of Texas. Uh, that way it's registered and valid and then turn it over to the bank. So the bank will accept it and, and, and allow you to cash checks and put it in your account there. So employees. So I've got a couple questions for you here. Let's read through them. In Texas, how many hours can you work in an employee before you give them a break? Just kind of put the answer in your head. Second question, in Texas, how long of an unpaid lunch break do you need to give your employees? Put that one in your head, think about it, okay, okay. Uh, next one, in Texas, how many hours does an employee need to work to be eligible for his paid half hour break? Okay, think about it for a second, okay. Here are your answers. What you're gonna find out is Texas doesn't regulate its employees too much there. We rely on federal law and federal law puts certain limits like overtime and you know uh, the child work limits and things like that. But Texas really does not regulate too much there. Uh, so you know nothing from the state of Texas is gonna work unless you decide not to pay your employees and then Texas really will get involved in such there. And so you're pretty flexible in what you do with your employees. And so, you know, you know, keep hitting that. Uh, you know, so we have all sorts of laws that will apply OSHA versus Texas kind of, we, 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 hopefully a worker doesn't get hurt. You can give them the right safety equipment, things like that. So little regulation, Texas, you got to comply with federal law. That's the main thing you got to do there. Now, at will is our standard here in Texas. That means I can fire my employees for any reason. Walked in, you were chewing gum, you're fired. That's a perfectly legitimate reason to fire someone in Texas. Huh, you got a bad hair day, fire that person. You got you know, any, you know, any reason you want to, except a discriminatory reason. For example, you're too old, I'll fire you. And you're gonna have problems if they're over 50. Uh, you know, you, you can't fire someone because of religion or sex or the color of their skin and all those that you should already know at this point there. Now, your at-will employment, of course, can't, it goes both ways. The employee can quit tomorrow too. Hmm, I got a bad hair day. I'm going to go quit and go get my hair cut or something like that. They can do that too. But you can modify it through contracts and to a certain extent with handbooks. Handbooks really are setting policies that are out there that the employees agreeing to follow as well as yourself. This becomes really important like with the discriminant, like harassment. That is the example I always like to kind of point out there. So, you know, and harassment's bad, we don't wanna have it. And, you know, it can be reported to EEOC who will give the right to sue letter and, and things like that. And one of the things that EEOC is gonna look at is whether the employee followed the procedures that the, uh, the employer has set out. And so you need in your handbook and such to outline what you know the procedure if someone is harassed, whether it's sexual or otherwise there, who do they report to? How does it need to be reported there? Because the company should have the right to be able to correct it. If one of my employees is being harassed, I wanna know about it and I want it taken care of. Uh, and so you know we gotta set up these procedures and that's where handbooks really help you out in these situations, the outlined procedures, outlined, you know, it prevents that argument that an employee can't, didn't know that they were breaking a rule because they, you got a signed handbook that said this is a violation and you know you weren't supposed to. Uh, there are agreements you may do with your employees, for example, non-competes are very popular. They're under all sorts of different rules. You gotta be careful. The main reason you usually do that is protect your information. Patent assignments, they create stuff for you. You wanna own it. And of course, you know, uh, if you're gonna terminate them early, perhaps you wanna give them a severance or other things to kind of limit some of the things that could have happened there. Uh, you know, this, there's a lot, you can do term contracts, you can do all sorts of things that give more protection, you just can't do less protection there. Uh, I got another question from Sylvia. What about if you have an at will and the contract if over, but the employee applies for unemployment and they get approved for that? Oh, if it is over there. If you have an at will and the contract, I mean, TWC does what it wants. If something goes in front of TWC, expect them to say that the employee gets paid. That's their default answer there. That's what they're around to do. That's what they happen there. Uh, you know, if you have a set contract for so long, I mean, you know, yeah, most of the time TWC is going to treat them as they're unemployed. I mean, unemployment is, they don't have a job. They, 
and usually through no fault of their own. So the description you're giving here is Savannah. Savannah, I'm sorry, it's a little tight and blue there. If I'm mispronouncing your name, please forgive me there. But you know, you got an employee with no father all own, don't have a job, they file for unemployment. It sucks that you know the last employer is the one that gets tagged on that one and has to pay it, but that's why it's insurance and it's considered insurance, it's just administered by the state. So employees. When we talk about employees, we always talk about independent contractors too, because people in businesses like to confuse the two quite a bit there. You know, you don't have to pay taxes for that guy. They're a straight expense and no taxes, you know, you, a lot less regulation at the federal level. And so, you know, you looked at all the advantages of an independent contractor versus an employee, you, see, you know, you can't get tagged for unemployment insurance on a true independent contractor. Why, why don't we just have independent contractors and not employees? You ask yourself there. And there's a reason for that there. It's because, there, and, and just to let you know, this is the test in shorthand of independent contractor versus employee test. And yes, this is the one we use in Texas. We have a 20 part test to determine if someone's an employee or a contractor. In fact, if you go over to TWC, they have a nice little thing you can download that sounds like it's Jeff Foxworthy wrote it. It says, you might be a contractor if you provided your own tools at the job. You might be an employee if your employer provided your tools. And so it goes through this entire thing. And yes, they use this. TWC, I was just working with, an with a client of mine who has a TWC claim, and they send out a questionnaire that basically asks these questions in different ways. And they're never gonna go one way or the other. For example, I am the ultimate mercenary. I'm a contractor by definition. I don't work for companies directly. Even the places I serve as general counsel, I'm a contractor there. And that's because you know I'm independent and such. But even out of those 20, I've got you know several of them. If you look at the slide here, you'll see several in red. Out of the 20, these are the ones that say I would be an employee. I've, I've got clients around for 15, 20 years. I've got a continuing relationship, which is number six. Number 12, I get paid hourly most of the time. Again, that would lean towards a employee. Number 13, I get my business and travel expenses reimbursed when I travel for my clients and such. Sometimes not. Sometimes I choose to eat them, but my contracts uh, gives me the right, and I do sometimes charge some. Uh, I, can't, I can't always quit. Uh, I, I have the right to be fired or quit without liability. Now, there's never, it's illegal under, under Texas law for an attorney to put restrictions on that. Uh, and so 19 and 20 both go uh, employee. So you can see it's, it's a huge test. So when you look at this test, the question really comes down to is, uh, <laughs> the, the question goes, how much control does the co company have over the contractor? The more control, the more it's more likely it's going to be an employee. Now, what really matters here? So we got all this 20 part test and you're like, oh my God, you know, which way should I decide? The important thing to remember here is the penalty for declaring someone a, an employee when they should be a contractor is you paid a little bit too much tax. You paid this, your half the social security, which is about six and a half percent. You had to pay your unemployment insurance on the person there, which is capped at your rate up to the first $9,000 that you paid them. And so you wasted that little bit of money. The penalty though, for calling someone an independent contractor that's really an employee is much, much higher because you basically committed tax evasion. You haven't paid that social security the way you were supposed to. So you didn't pay your taxes and you didn't pay your unemployment insurance, which Texas sees as a tax in a way there too there. And so you're gonna have someone possibly from the state and or feds coming after you for not doing it. So, you know, if you're in a question of, you know, is this guy a, or uh, this person a uh, employee or contractor and it's gray and they're gonna be there for a while and such, call them an employee. Take the hit, get her done. You have a lot less to worry about than a contractor. Now, if they're only gonna be there three months and they're doing a fixed thing, they have a lot of control, they brought their own tools, you know, don't misclassify them and waste that money. They're contracted there, but it comes down, are they an independent business that you're hiring or is it a person you're, you're treating like an employee? You gotta make that, that question there. If it's close, 
I, lay, I err on the side of saying, hey, that's an employee. And I'll warn you, you know, I mean, you'll get tagged because an employee turns you in, or you might be random. You may get your lottery ticket pulled by TWC. I have. I've been audited by TWC. And at the time, I had one employee, and it was actually right after I had my first employee. So I had never had anybody to file a complaint against. I had no contractors, nothing. It was a long, it was a short, boring uh, audit for them, but they randomly audit you. And you go, ooh, here's your desk. Here's access to my books. Check me out. Tell, make sure I haven't done anything bad. I was very comfortable when that happened, except trying to protect my client information, which I had to screen, which caused a lot of work there. But you know, if I had people on the gray area, I would be very nervous and concerned about that. So, all right, next up here, the golden rule of contracts. If you signed it, you read it, and agreed to it and meant it. The, the worst defense you ever say is, oh, I didn't know it said that. If you signed it, you're gonna be hung with it. So watch yourself on that. Oral contracts are contracts in Texas. They really are. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to, uh, to get that close. Uh, they're fully enforceable in Texas and eligible for attorney fees if you breach them. Some contracts have to be in writing. For example, you're selling goods over 500. It has to be in writing to be enforceable. Though if it's been fully executed, it's still valid. Uh, it guarantee a person's debt. If I say, Bob, I'm paying your debts on that loan you took out, that's got to be in writing to be enforced against me there. Uh, real estate. If I'm selling property, it's got to be in writing to be enforceable. A marriage is always required. That's a lot less common nowadays. It used to be you, you were selling your daughter into uh, marriage, slavery, whatever you want to call it there. Uh, it had to be in writing to be enforceable or you could break it. You, you, she couldn't, but you know that's the old days. Uh, thank goodness there. And of course, contracts that cannot be performed within a year have to be there. If it can be performed in 365 days, it doesn't have to be in writing, but it's 366. Uh, it has to go that long, then it needs to be in writing. Anything else, it can be oral. Now there's proof issues, of course. We never know, you know, it, it may be a swearing match on what it actually was that agreement, but the agreement still exists. You don't know how many people go to me. There's not a contract there. It was just an oral agreement. That's like saying that there's not a contract. We have a contract. So non-disclosure agreements, very important. You should have that setting in your box as a business owner. It's a just an agreement to keep your secret secret. There might be, there's exceptions under the law and such. You want an injunction so you can shut them up if they try to use it there. Very important to protect your, uh, protect your secrets. In fact, all non-competes and such are based upon these non-disclosure agreements. And non-competes we don't like, but we enforce the heck out of them in Texas. In fact, nowadays, uh, the state of Texas has required uh, judges to rewrite the agreement if it's unenforceable. Uh, before it's rewritten, you're not in violation, then the judge rewrites it and you're in violation. And so they're usually done on employees that have some information that would hurt the employer. That's usually what brings it there. Uh, but on the same time, you know, uh, you do it for business sales, a few other things. You got to have a good reason, though, to, to get that there. Intellectual property, very important. Trademarks, they're going to tell people where your uh, the, the source of goods, it identifies, lets you know who produced the goods or services. So the consumer is protected. You got copyrights if we create crop, uh, creative works, and that includes programming, you know, software and things like that. Patents if you invent, invent stuff like that. You got trade secrets, your secrets that give you an advantage, like Coca Cola, things like that. Uh, you know, I go into a lot more detail on this thing. We're running out of time. Uh, but, you know, trade secrets are the big thing that we're trying to protect, you know, when it comes to non-competes and such, because you give your trade secrets as a business to your employees, your employees, uh, we don't want them taking those trade secrets to your competitors, and it's very, very enforceable. The, the most famous one, the Coca-Cola formula, has actually been stolen before and presented to Pepsi. Pepsi was offered the Coca-Cola formula and they called the FBI and Coca-Cola when it was handed to them because they knew that the damages of stealing the Coca-Cola formula would be so astronomically high that it, it would have bankrupt even Pepsi. So, you know, very protected there, very important things, the purpose of there. 
Patents are created by the Constitution, so is that the copyright. It's designed for inventions. It's something so new and innovative that we're willing to give a monopoly to the person who did it uh, because they did it and told society about it so we could use it. There's a lot of overlap between uh, patents and trade secrets. Something you can do in an invention and keep as a trade secret. Coca-Cola could have been patented. They didn't. Uh, patents are only good for a very limited time, 20 years. Trade secrets can last forever. So there are definitely advantages and disadvantages. Patents have a lot more better enforcement though, uh, and gives you a lot more viciousness and such. Trademarks, identify your goods. They can be all sorts of things. As simple as a color. If you see pink insulation, I guarantee it was created by Owens Corning. Uh, you can have sounds like B, B, B for NBC. Uh, if I was tone deaf, not tone deaf, it would make more sense. Names, of products and such, all sorts of things. The whole point on trademarks is that, you know, it, it, you, if there's confusion with the consumer, the, the court's going to enforce. If you don't have uh, confusion, you got a chance that probably the, it, there's not an infringement there. And just because you've got a business name for it does not mean that you can use the name as a trade name. For example, Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream Incorporated is fully available in the state of Texas. I could form that company in five minutes. I can't sell ice cream under the name or the soap guys over at Unilever are gonna sue me into the stone age there. So even though the secretary of state says your business name's good, check for your trademarks or you're gonna be in some trouble or could be there. Should you file a trademark? You actually create trademark rights just by using the mark in commerce. You can also file a trademark to get better rights. You can do it with the feds or the states. Uh, it really depends on your situations there. I'm getting marked up there and I don't even know how that's happening. But anyway, you know, there's lots of different, th uh, th these are complicated questions. Talk to someone that's in, that deals with these things. Remember cost, uh, registering a trademark will probably run you about 1500 or so, depending on the situation. A free, you know, a registered one, using it in commerce is free. It, you know, money's always tight when you're bootstrapped, watch yourselves there. Copyright, uh, created by the constitution again, it lasts practically forever. We call them Mickey Mouse laws because Congress keeps extending it to allow Mickey Mouse to uh, not fall into the public domain. That's finally ending just because uh, Disney now uses it as a trademark, which will protect it forever anyway. So they wasted all this time and money when they could have just used a trademark and been good. They're, the nice thing on copyright or the bad thing, depending on your point of view, there's statutory damages for a violation. If there's violation, it ranges from $750 to up to 150,000 if you do it intentionally and it can be troubled or times three if you did it willfully. So watch yourself on that. Fair use, people always ask me the question of fair use. It's a test of whether your infringement can be uh, prosecuted or not, uh, but you know, for money and such. This is the test, it's a balancing one and it all boils down to, did you increase or decrease demand of the stuff we're talking about? The copyright, sometimes it applies to trademark, uh, if you are costing them money, it's almost always not fair use. If it, you're making the money, it doesn't. It, there's a good chance it's fair use there. I got some pointers here on how to uh, hire an attorney. Uh, you can do it through re referrals. That's an important thing there. Check them out. Uh, you know, talk with a couple of attorneys. Yeah, attorneys, it's all about fit. You can tell I'm a very serious person that, you know, wants to always, you know, be very serious and gruff about everything here. And perhaps I'm not the best fit for some people. Other people, I would be a good fit there. It's all about what's right for you. You're the client, pick the attorney that's gonna be the right fit for you, not the other way around. It'll work out much better, especially with your general business attorney and such. You may have to hire specialists at different times. You got a tax issue, a heavy end trademark, what have you there. You know, those, you know, you still need to look at referrals, make sure it's the people that are good for you there. But again, trust is the most important thing with any of your professionals, whether it's an accountant, your uh, attorney, all of us there. Here's some places to get an attorney if you need one. You got a lawyer referral of Central Texas. They charge 20 bucks. If you tell them you're a score client, I think they still waive that fee. So when you say, hey, I'm a score guy, they send me over there. That's good for all of Austin, whether you're in Hayes County, Travis, or Williamson, they, they, that's just the old name they use. There's a statewide one. And then if you're looking for free services, LAMP, if you qualify under the Rio Grande, under the Rio Grande uh, aid system there. 
Uh, finally, when you're dealing with this, read your agreement, to, you know, stay focused on your issues there and also uh, review everything. You know, you know your situation better than anyone else. When I'm writing something, a lot of times I mean, you know, a name is just a name. And if there's a typo or something like that, it looks the same to me. If the numbers are wrong, it's just a number to me. I, we always try to be absolutely accurate, but you know your deal better than anyone else, what you've set up there, read it, check it. Even if you don't completely understand it, ask for it to be explained because when you sign it, you know it, you agree to it and you meant to, okay there. Uh, check the bills, trust your gut. Remember my job is to be an advocate and to tell you what I think and try to convince you to do the right thing that I think is best. But in the end, it's your decision. I advise and then execute your will. That's what attorneys do there. It's your business. If your business goes under, I move on to the next clients. You gotta clean up the mess there. You gotta deal with it there. If, on the converse, you make billions of dollars. I got my fee and I'm, I've done this more than once. You look at your rich, rich clients going, man, I wish I had a piece of that action, but you know, that's that's the life of an attorney here. We're here to be a, uh, uh, a heartless mercenary. We're the Ronin, the modern Ronin of today. Uh, we're not quite samurai. We, 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 we attack for fee. Uh, here is uh, my contact information. Uh, you can grab my email address. You can grab my uh, phone number. If you've got questions, uh, we'll send out a copy of the slides here in a little bit. Bill will get that taken care of there. Uh, if you got questions though, you wanna ask me, send me an email. I'm happy to answer them. I always warn people though here, I volunteer to answer questions and such, but some questions, you know, it aren't free answers. There's some, you gotta respect that sometimes I gotta go, look, that question's gonna cost you. I've had people, oh, and don't send me documents. I've had people send me documents before. I won't look at them. I won't review them. I got a lady yell at me for about five minutes about what an SOB I was because she sent me a, like a seven page contract to review. And I went, well, you got to hire me for that. And she goes, you said you would help out. You blah, 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 blah. And it's like, I'm a volunteer here. So I'm happy to help, but, you know, and give suggestions and point you in the right direction there. But if you actually want me to do real work, I'll probably uh, say, hey, we're going to have to set up a relationship and bill. So that's my stuff. We'll see uh, Bill or Gita to come in here. Oh, there's Bill. Thank you, sir. I'm on time. Amazing. Yes, you are. And a lot of good information delivered very quickly. I appreciate it. <laughs> so assuming there are no more questions since we really are about out of time, I think we'll call it a day. Uh, and again, we appreciate your time, Darren. Uh, Gita, thanks for hosting. Uh, and unless there, either of you have anything else to say, I'm going to go ahead and shut us down and uh, we'll get the recording out when it's ready and when I have the... Uh, Slides from Darren. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.